Hey, welcome to PayPod, where we bring you conversations with the trailblazers shaping the future of payments and fintech. My name is Kevin Rosenquist. Thanks for listening. Elizabeth Rossiello always dreamed of traveling the world. After getting her master's in international business and finance, she took her talents to Germany, Kenya, and now lives in London, where she's the CEO and founder of Aza Finance, a leading provider of cross-border payment solutions focusing primarily on African markets. The company aims to bridge the gap between African economies and the global financial system and help small and medium-sized businesses be successful and be able to pay in their local currencies. She's crazy smart, She's very funny and has incredible insight on global fintech. Please welcome Elizabeth Rossiello. Your experience is vast. Um, I, I want to start with your role as co-chair of the World Economic Forum Global Fourth Industrial Revolution Council on Blockchain. It's a, it's a mouthful. Uh, there, are, there are many different parts of what has been called the Fourth Industrial Revolution, AI, Internet of Things, quantum computing, robotics. Uh, blockchain is another one. There are a lot of people who aren't quite on board with the blockchain, or at least don't see it as a way of the future. T tell me why people should be bullish on the blockchain. Okay, well, a uh, big question here. I think, you know, Tim Draper likes to talk about the curve of, of innovation, where, you know, there's the initial curve. Everybody gets excited about something, you know, AI. Suddenly it's on every list, it's every question, the blockchain, the blockchain, every question. People get interested in it. And then they're kind of like, is this it? You know, I, you know, I heard about it at every dinner party, but my life hasn't changed. You know, I still yeah. use my feet to walk to the store. I'm, I'm brushing my teeth with my own hand and a toothbrush. You know, like, wow, robots haven't in, invaded my, my home. And then they go away, but graduates have entered that field. Companies have started building. Investments were made. And at least a part of that continues to innovate. And then after a bit of a sleeper period comes the next big bump. And you're like, oh, well, no, this is AI or this is blockchain. This is what it means. And we've seen that a couple of times. And it sounds very cliched or cheesy to say we don't know how this will be, but we know it'll be big. You know, it's like David Bowie. I don't know where I'm going, but it's going to be weird. You know, um, for the technology to become more mainstream. Well, first of all, a lot of people on panels don't know what it means either. So don't worry. <laughs> so it's not just my parents is what you're saying. A lot of investors and people who run conferences also don't know. <laughs> I think that's also what tells me we've got a long way to go. Right. Um, and let's yeah, that was, I would say so. <laughs> my mom bought some Bitcoin day one. Wow. Um, be a supportive mob and she's like all in now you know 10 years later so hooray for her and she's a she was a school teacher so you know what what i talk about it is very simplified terms you have a closed database and an open database you know this is a very you know dumbed down version or like very simplified version you know you have your own spreadsheet that calculates your household expenses but what if you could open that spreadsheet up to the world and that spreadsheet had rules and the spreadsheet itself was determining what you're allowed to enter. And if you were to lie and say, I didn't spend that much on sweets, the spreadsheet would say, nope, you did. Sure you did. Know? You know, it corrected you. And it wasn't you making that choice and it wasn't your neighbor or anybody else, but actually the spreadsheet had its own powers and it recorded things. So it's kind of very scary actually for governments to use a blockchain or corporations because that's against the incentives of a corporation is to protect private. They want closed loop governments too, central banks too. So that's why I always, you know, take CBDCs and these central bank digital currencies with a grain of salt because it's against the interest of a lot of players. So while the technology is there, imagine an open system where we can set some rules and then it keeps everybody honest. But in fact, many people don't want that. So it hasn't taken off as much as we want it to because most people want privacy. Most they don't want transparency. Yeah. yeah, they want to control things themselves. So with the technology, it's quite exciting. But I think the initial investors or governments have, you know, not fully gone into it yet. And what we really need is, you know, students and the next generation to start building organizations um, that, they're, that they're excited to use. We're looking at you, Gen Z. It's all on you. <laughs> Gen L. <laughs> Gen Al yeah, I think my, my I have a three year old. I think I saw that he's Gen Generation Alpha. So maybe Generation really? Alpha is what we need to what, what what's next. <laughs> um, 
What about smart contracts? I've I've always kind of been intrigued by smart contact contracts. You know where the where the terms are embedded into the code. Do you, do you see larger use cases for smart contracts? Do you think that's going to pop? Are you kidding me? I've lived all over the world. You know how many times I've gotten my security deposit back. <laughs> you know? Imagine if it was automatically released. <laughs> yeah, that alone, that's what it would be. You know, imagine that. Imagine if you make a deal with your older brother and he's forced to keep it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's pretty cool to have these kinds of things. It's a automatic escrow, yeah. right? You know, escrows are still. I, I just got divorced. Escrows still have a lot of rules, a lot of people, a lot of judges, a lot of things involved. It's not so automatic. I think it would be as seamless, seamless as like, you know, going to your Amazon pickup box and opening it, you know, and you guarantee that that's there. I think that's the goal of a smart contract where you make a contract and nobody's feelings can change it. Do you, is, is that going to be another thing people are going to resist because it'll hold them to <laughs> well, hold them to things? No more welching. I know a lot of landlords who don't want that, right? I'm sure, you know, yeah. but there are people who do. And, you know, at least at the start of a lot of negotiations and agreements, people say they do. So, you know, they tend to change their mind when they disagree later on. Sure. So maybe the goodwill at the start of it will, will spread the use of good contracts. Yeah, yeah. So you, you've been all over the world since graduating from Columbia in 2006 with an MA in international business and finance. I saw Germany, Kenya, London. I'm sure there are probably more. What what drove you to want to be involved, is so so involved in the global financial world? I mean, I'm always a person that had maps all over my room. I mean, this sounds cliched, but, you know, my grandpa gave me a National Geographic subscription. I wanted to see the world. I'm the youngest child, the middle of like a million cousins and a big family. So I was meant to go out of New York City. And I learned a lot of languages so I could do that. I thought that was my way out. I'd be a translator. Uh, when I think back to, you know, the women I saw with leadership roles, I was just like, wow, my, my rich aunt is a secretary. Maybe one day I'll be a foreign language secretary. You know, I really did think that was going to be my career goal. I remember my counselor in school was like, are you serious, Elizabeth? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, know well, you could probably go to law school. You could great grades. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so, you know, I initially went abroad because of my languages. Um, and then when I got abroad, I was just like, wow, um, eyes open. And I remember saying, and I've said this before publicly, but it was the start of the Iraq war. And I saw things in the newspaper in Berlin that I hadn't seen in New York. And I thought we were so liberal and so, you know, educated in New York City. We were, you know, held it all for the rest of the country, how smart we were. Meanwhile, still had a media blockade and didn't didn't see a lot of things. So my eyes really opened and I became quite curious. And, you know, my German colleagues in the parliament where I was working were like, look at what your people are doing. And I was like, I honestly didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I did. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. I didn't know. I mean, it's not my fault, but it is my fault, you know, and I just became <laughs> really it's curious. Fault, but you can blame me. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have the blockchain yet. Just hotmail. Yeah, you know? just hotmail. <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah. Yeah. So I took a day and I stayed abroad. That's cool. That's cool. I, I you're, you're, it's, you're in London now. Um, and now you're CEO and founder of AZA Finance. Is it AZA or AZA? Sorry. It's AZA, yeah. AZA, AZA Finance, uh, a leading provider of cross-border payment solutions, focusing primarily on African markets. What what drew you to Africa specifically? So I was working in investment banking. I left secretary work. <laughs> and I, got, <laughs> I went to Goldman Sachs. That's a but you were going to be so rich. <laughs> <laughs> and then I... Somehow got into Goldman Sachs M&A <laughs> and then went to Credit Suisse. I was like, wow, I'm good at these obligations. <laughs> and then um, I just hated everybody I worked with. They were just tool bags. And I looked online and Muhammad Yunus had won the Nobel Peace Prize in microfinance. I started reading about it. And I was like, says finance, I could probably do this. And got a job with them and wanted to go to Asia. And they were like, nope, you're going to East Africa. So that's how I got there. Thought I'd be there a year, stayed eight in Kenya, had two kids, and did a ton of field work. And when I was doing this field work, I kept seeing all these great institutions, well-meaning, you know, management, all this cool technology with mobile money coming in, but all of their financing and funding was in dollar or euro. And then like they're on lending in African currencies. And I was like, this is so irresponsible. Yeah. Who the heck is lending to them in hard currencies and not hedging it 
and making them eat the FX loss. And I was just like, it was like going to Berlin and looking at the newspaper. I was like, what? They think these... The World Bank is doing this to these people, like these institutions and like all these development institutions are doing this. And like, all, I won't name them here, but I wrote report after report about it. And I was like, where's the local currency financing? And like you had it in Southeast Asia, you had it in South um, America, you had it in India, but you didn't have it in Sub-Saharan Africa. And, you know, then I started like yapping and writing about like financial colonialism and like how we're, you know, insisting on these hard currencies. It's unfair. And, you know, I just was quite interested in the topic. And on one of my projects, I met an investor who was quite interested in Bitcoin. And he was like, well, could you use this to, you know, trade with other markets? And I was like, how do we use it as a way to lower the cost of buying and selling African currencies? And that was initially the idea. Um, and we started to trade Kenyan shilling US dollar by Bitcoin. And we got down to quite cheap. I think it was like 6 7% at the best bank. And we got it down to like less than a percent. Um, and then, you know, we evolved from there. And then we realized actually Africa, Africa currency pairs weren't available. So how do you trade Kenyan shilling Nigerian Naira? How do you trade Naira South African Rand? And sometimes we use Bitcoin in the middle in the beginning. But as we grew our own infrastructure, we realized we didn't really need to use it. So sometimes the, the blockchain or cryptocurrencies aren't needed. And in this case, we had our infrastructure on both sides. We were the left and the right hand side. And so we just grew from there. And then funnily enough, people wanted digital currencies later on and stable coins as one of their currencies. So we started trading them again. So, you know, I think when you're open to innovation and you're not like fixed on a thesis and, you know, you're you're looking to solve a problem of creating liquidity between currencies, you can use different technologies along the journey. And, you know, you don't have to force it. If there's not a use case at that time, it doesn't make sense. You can evolve it. Um, and then when it comes back in favor, you're open to it again. So, you know, as a trader, we're all about optionality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Stuck to a thesis. That's good. I uh, I haven't heard that before, but I that, that makes sense that a lot of people are stuck to a thesis and aren't, aren't willing to innovate and all that. And you guys, one of your things is to kind of help break down barriers for small and medium sized businesses that, you know, that they face by you know, providing accessible financial services is what you guys are, are kind of big on. So. What are the most significant barriers you've seen throughout your career and how have you been able to help SMEs overcome them? It's so hard for businesses in one country in Africa to buy hard currencies still. And it's so hard for them to buy other African currencies. And like they have an invoice right now. Most of the FMCG goods sold across the African continent. And remember, these are populations that are booming. Most of planet Earth will be African at the turn of the century. Imagine that. And so, soap, shampoo, razors toothbrushes, clothes, everything, everything you see in a store is coming from the Middle East, it's coming from Southeast Asia, all the pot noodles, all the instant ramen, all the cool stuff in the grocery stores, all the stuff from Asia, all of it's coming into the continent. How do these buyers buy it? I know so many people, so many clients who are buying anything from a half a shipping container to like a container a day of goods. How do they make those payments? And, you know, maybe they're selling them across border. They're they're exporting tea to Sri Lanka. Kenya is the second largest tea exporter. Al aluminum, which comes out of Kenya, Uganda, you know, sugar out of Senegal. There's so much happening on the African continent and they can't pay simple invoices. It would take them two weeks because they couldn't get access to those currencies. Now we let them pay in local currency and we find a swap for the currency payment abroad. And, you know, we now see customers start out with us, still trading with us seven, 10 years later. Just today, like a 7-Up importer in one of my markets, I see his, like, you know, invoice every every couple of weeks. And I'm like, yeah, we brought him on so many years ago. He's one of our smaller clients. But, you know, he's, we see his steady trade growing. Other big clients want to enter a new market. They might want to enter Francophone or they might want to expand their business to Southern Africa. And they can start trading with us. And then since they're already onboarded, it's very easy for them to just access the different currencies. They don't have to even think about it. When before, it would have been a major impediment to growing their business. And why? Why? What? Why was it so difficult? Why did? Why did? Uh, Asla have to come in and and make it a thing. Foreign exchange is not the first product a lot of banks like to invest in, and with such a young population, the retail market and retail products was very popular, and the high end lending 
was very profitable. So even the worst banks, and I won't name them, were being quite profitable with very few products and terrible customer support. Trading FX is difficult. That's so. That's number one. Number two, the the banking groups across the continent have different operational codes or op codes in each market. So you have one big brand bank. It's a totally different bank in in Senegal than it is in Ghana. They don't have the same IT system. They don't have the same P and L. They don't have the same trading, the same risk. They have no idea how to trade across HSBC, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Same system. They can communicate in a way that they weren't across. Africa. And that really created a huge cost impediment to trading FX. Because FX means instant settlement because these currencies are moving. You can't take a long time to settle. The currency will have moved. Number two, you need to know how much you have everywhere at any given time to be able to price that. And the systems weren't interacting. So a lot of operational and technical reasons why the banks weren't good at FX. And then just a lot of social and demographic reasons about easier places they could make money. Hmm. And te- technology, uh, blah, blah, blah. technological advancements certainly have helped ease the burden of cross-border transactions. What, what's been the most significant change since you founded AZA that has allowed cross-border transactions to happen more seamlessly? Well, you know, I don't want to toot our own horn too loud, but I really do think it's about the team we've built and our operations. We've done something that's rare, which is build Pan-African stateless operations. Now, a lot of fintechs are like, I have a great product. It works really well in one market, and they kill it in that market. But they struggle to offer it in many markets. And if you look at the top five, ten fintechs, they're they're really big in one or two markets, but not across markets. Our product in our DNA has to, by definition, be continental, be international, be global. You can't trade FX domestically. <laughs> so... You know, from the beginning, we had to make sure one team trusted another, one FX test trusts the other, same risk, same onboarding. It's a lot of processes and procedures, and we are really good at that. Technology has helped with that. Modern team culture, working culture, agile methodology has helped with that. You know, we do a whole bunch of mushy stuff. We do coaching. We do team building. We do, like, KPI monitoring. We use a lot of online tools. From Lattice to Bamboo, obviously Slack, you know, um, Atlassian, a million things to make that easier. And I think a lot of old-fashioned financial services companies, especially those in FX, don't do that. Yeah, yeah, I would guess, I would guess that. So you're like, so you're you're not just helping transactions. You're you're kind of trying to help these businesses just succeed in general. Yeah. I mean, when our customers grow, we grow. I, I spent the whole day in Nairobi with one of our biggest new customers entering the continent. And they're like, how do we grow in all these five markets? And we're like, this is how you do payouts. This is how you do collections. This is how you do settlement. We can handle FX. We offer many services. We do payouts. We do collections. But really, we focus on the FX. But I will do those other things because the customers need them and it helps them give me more FX. We always talk about it as like a restaurant that offers delivery. I don't really talk about the motorcycles that deliver the food, <laughs> you know, yeah. but the glamorous part, but you need them because if, not, if they don't get the food there on time, nobody will order your delicious, expensive, and fancy food, right? Mm-hmm. So we really have very quality food. We have the best FX wholesale on the market, best prices, fastest settlement, and then we are able to give our customers great, customers great APIs for payouts and collections as well. Politics, humanitarian issues plague Africa regularly whether it's dictatorships, genocides, hunger, now the war in Sudan, the situation in Haiti. Every country, every continent has their fair share of disasters and turmoil, but it must be hard working with African companies and people when there are so many issues that pop up regularly. How do, how do you manage that? Well, I'm from New York. <laughs> and I grew up in an immigrant neighborhood. I mean, I'm not, like, from Connecticut. <laughs> Life wasn't easy for me. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> We're not hating on the Connecticut folks. In this case, right? I mean, life. I grew up in an inner city. Life wasn't easy. I'm used to all sorts of lifestyles and socioeconomics. I'm not afraid of any of that. Um, so that didn't phase me. Um, I've worked across so many co- 
regulatory regimes when I was working in microfinance. I was writing reports on what the regulation was, and I visited a lot of central banks, and I met with them. And I just, just like anything, when you study a whole group of something, you see patterns. So I would be like, okay, these these couple of countries have the same sort of regulatory regime. These ones have the same sort of incentives. This one is this one. So I definitely saw patterns. We, we grouped it into structures, into, you know, ones that were forward-thinking, ones that were on the Anglophone legal, ones were on the Francophone, ones that are the commodity-based. So yes, there's 55 markets, but I do see similarities in some and others. I also think if you have a model of approach where you're coming into something and you're like, these are the five options it could be. If each five option, this is the way we're going to go. And it's like a menu, you know, a choose your own adventure. And you have a structure for it. You have a structure for flexibility. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. You know, I think the problem is when you come in, you're like, this is our model. And it must work everywhere. And then you're like, oh, it doesn't fit. So, I mean, for us, we assume everything is going to be custom. Almost like a hit by ride show. Each market will be custom. But we know it can only have so many parts. It's got to have wheels, a hood, a, you know, a roof, a steering wheel. It might be different colors, different combinations, but it's going to have these components. And we just expect it to be custom every time. So that's how we handle that. I mean, I don't freak out with volatility. It's a place to find arbitrage. And I think also America's bonkers. So, you know. No, you're not wrong there. Trust me. You, <laughs> I live here. So, uh, yeah, it's. You you have no idea. <laughs> For many years, people were like, oh, my God, come back home. I'm like, why? Why would I do that? <laughs> you, you guys know, should so, all leave. What are you, nuts? They're like, oh, then you have your kids in kindergarten. And I'm like, how can you have your kids in kindergarten there? So, I mean, I think it's also just perception. You yeah. know, I was like the poorest person in my neighborhood when I lived in Nairobi. Like, it's very affluent places. And. People would be like, do you have shampoo? Do you have salt there? Um, my neighbor's got three Range Rovers, you know? <laughs> so, you know, I have an incredible, like, sushi restaurant I go to. So I think it's also perception of how wild it is. Yeah. And, you know, of course, we don't have all great elections there. But, again, neither is America. I think it's just more out there. People yeah. admit it more. People talk about corruption more. It's more open about it. I think in other places I've lived, like Luxembourg. Or, or the United States, mm-hmm. maybe it's not mentioned as much. Yeah, yeah, it's hidden, um, hidden more. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think too. A lot of times you see the footage of you know, and it's not not that it's not real, but like of people with guns and walking around the streets and stuff. So I think that that Wild West kind of, you know, perception. You're right, kind of is perpetuated here in this country. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of poverty in America, and like you can drive around your neighborhood and not see it. I think the difference in a lot of African capitals is the poverty and the affluent neighborhoods mix more. Like, you know, I live in London where every few blocks there's a council estate, even in the fanciest neighborhoods. And it's like mansions, council, mansions, council. <laughs> you know, there are parts of New York, obviously, where you can go for a long time where you don't see see that. I think right. it, it depends. So is it more on your faith? For sure. But um, I think I think for us, on the continent, we just take it as it is. When there is, you know, kind of larger government turmoil, like what's happening in Haiti is a good example. Does that, how big of an impact does that have on the way you do business? Well, I mean, definitely in elections, we've sat home sometimes or changes of control. There have been floods. I mean, like every kind of thing has happened in 11 years in all these markets. It's some really horrific flood, flooding in Nairobi, et cetera. I was living in Nairobi when we had the Constitution come in, and obviously it was a little hectic right before. You know, police would stop you all the time. Things were like that. There was a lot more violence. After the Constitution, it was very peaceful. So, you know, I think for us, it's just like, how do you operate through all seasons? How do you operate when the market's up or down? How do you operate when there's election or non-election season? How do you operate, you know, when there's cash from VCs or not cash from VCs? I think the idea is how do you have a defendable revenue model in all seasons? That makes sense. And then you you mentioned 11 years. Like I think, what is it? You're almost 11 years, right? You hit 10 years yeah. in business uh, somewhat recently. Congrats, by the way, on that. Yep. Yeah, Did but you... couple months to 11. I think it's like October. October is 11. Cool. Did you Did you have a 10-year plan when you started this thing? Oh, my God. I just wanted to like make a salary for a year. Did... <laughs> I was like, I want to employ myself so I get make a salary. That's it. 
I mean, this is beyond my wildest dreams. I think a lot of women, even, you know, nerdy ones like me, just don't dream big enough. And, you know, I'm like whispering in my daughter's ears every night. They're like, mom, like, go watch Netflix. Leave us alone. I'm like, dream big, dream big. <laughs> Anything. I just like, want to go to sleep. <laughs> like, mom, go have a snack and get out of our bedroom. <laughs> So, you know, I I mean, I definitely didn't think it would get to this. Along the way, you know, it's been so wild. But I think the last couple of years, we've hit our stride. We see these gigantic clients that we always dreamed of coming in. And, like, no, we have a, a, a motto inside the company, no clients too big anymore. And there were definitely times where, like, that client's too big for us. Yeah, absolutely. especially like, in the beginning stages, yeah. Yeah, you're like, client's too big. And, like, stealing clients from our clients, or we're like, get the middleman out of the way. That's a good feeling, you know, and then you really feel like we own we own the ground, we own the territory. And, you know, I think market positioning is tough to acquire. And if you really want to go big and you like stake your camp way out, way out beyond where everybody else is, you're like, haha, I'm a genius or a fool. You know, it mm -hmm. takes a while to realize that that property was worth something. So that's where we are right now. And it feels really good. And it feels like we got a lot of energy to keep going because this is this is the fun part. Yeah, I'm either a genius or a fool. I feel like that's probably every entrepreneur's start, right? Right, right. That's what you're going to say right off the bat as well. This is either going to be really successful or I am screwed. I'm very, very... every day. <laughs> Pretty much how we start our morning stand-up. <laughs> that's your, <laughs> your morning breakout. You're like, okay, all right, we might be crazy or uh, we might do really well. We'll see. All right. <laughs> it's a day-by-day -day thing for you guys, huh? Yeah. Um, what What's next for, for Aza? Would you have anything in the, in the pipeline that you guys are working on? We want to see our exchange rate up there on Bloomberg. We want to see our rates, you know, all the way at the top. We want to really be known as the market maker. I think that's the next big goal. First, we wanted to see that clients wanted the product. We, we found that product market fit. We wanted to see if we could expand and, you know, get regulated, survive the fintech, you know, desert, which is the gray area until regulation comes and then get a license. We've done that. We've got over five licenses and even more coming, you know. And now it's really just like establish ourselves amongst the incumbents and, you know, more and more legitimacy and change the way the market is priced and that was the initial goal right is a more accurate risk analysis for this continent and if you if you price the risk more accurately it won't be overpriced and it won't be indebting people who shouldn't be indebted mm -hmm. i guess sounds like a great goal and uh, uh if not you always have secretary <laughs> yeah i could go back to germany and translate documents you could be a secretary and make the big bucks <laughs> Well, I, my secretaries are like Elizabeth. I could do this. Leave it. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, Elizabeth, thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate uh, your time, and I, I really enjoyed talking with you. <laughs> <laughs>